This is the American Law Journal. It's been 50 years since the Equal Pay Act. Are women still waiting? Good evening and welcome to season 27 on the American Law Journal. I'm Christopher Naughton. It's one thing to say that women's salaries are lagging in many professions. It's another to say that perhaps, perhaps one of the worst is the legal profession itself. Gina Passarella explains. Wexler versus Hamlin, Hamlin, Miguel. You want me to sue my own firm? Filing's all typed up, it's ready to go. First order of business, we get a great employment law attorney. Show them we mean business. <sighs> You're here at midnight in this glorified cell block busting your ass for what? Even if I won, who would hire me? That would be career suicide. All right. From the scripts of Hollywood to the interiors of law firms, equal pay for women is a case that's been building for decades. If you think there's no protection under the law, you'd be wrong. JFK signing the Equal Pay Act in 1963. Obama reversing the Supreme Court with the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. But if you think the legal profession is taking the lead protecting pay rights for women, you'd likely be wrong again. I am not encouraged by how far we've come since my case. Attorney Nancy Easold's lawsuit against the Wolfblock Law Firm made history was the first case ever brought by a woman attorney and tried to a verdict uh, against a law firm for denial uh, of partnership. And Winning at the trial level, the but losing on appeal. Isolde's case nevertheless sent shockwaves through the legal profession. But more than two decades later, there's still a wide gap. Today, women partners earn about 20 percent of what a male partner earns. And um, if you go up to equity partner, then you're talking about even less. And in the very recent research done by ALM, uh, the study found that only 8% of women, only 8% of women make $500,000 or more. That means 92% of men are earning more than women. But there has been pushback. Consider the issue of the so-called gender wage gap. How many times have you heard that for the same work, Women receive 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. Yet it is so deeply misleading as to border on outright falsehood. Number one, when you're saying fight for equal rights, I mean, a lot of these big defense firms are on the side of the employer uh, saying, no, there's no discrimination, there's no unequal treatment, these are just disgruntled individuals. Which is why women in many professions, including the law, are taking the gloves off. In the last few months, four high-profile female lawyers sued their respective law firms for gender discrimination, one in a $100 million class action lawsuit. Certainly in the, I think, the Chad Burnham Park case, the allegation is it's an all-male leadership team. And I think whenever you have that, that does raise questions about why is there not a single person of my protected status, you know, a woman, on your leadership team or executive team. And actually, we're we're perhaps the last of the high-end professions not to be hit with these kinds of cases, so in my mind it was only a matter of time. As a plaintiff's lawyer now, Easel knows all too well that suing an employer is not the easiest road to take. In her own case, she tried to resolve things internally to no avail. At one point I even offered one of the managing partners to come to a courtroom the next day where I was going to be examining a witness. And I said, if you come to the courtroom, and you leave feeling I'm not qualified for partner, I'll walk away. And he never showed up. Some suggest the problem starts with women. As a woman, we almost put this gender bias in ourselves. I mean, how much are you going to diminish yourself in order to get along when getting along means you're not going ahead? You're just, you know, the woman that goes and gets a coffee uh, when the guys are discussing the case. How about some coffee? No, thank you. Would you mind making me some? I think sometimes women are our own worst enemies. That may be so, but there seems to be a shift. We've got women now in the workforce who have been raised with the idea that, that um, sex equity is for them and they're entitled to it. Much different from my generation. So yes, it had to be brought. I think a lot of good came out of it. I can't tell you how many women have come to me and said, I made partner and I never would have had it not been for your case. The gender pay equity issue is far from new, but it seems to have reached a fevered pitch, impacting everything from state legislation to the presidential election and employers who are facing an increasing number of lawsuits, and the legal industry is far from immune. 
but for many, change is not happening fast enough. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, four guests with me tonight. Let's go ahead and meet them. Christine Grady Derowitz joins us for the first time tonight. She is with the corporate defense firm of Littler Mendelssohn, and Chris represents employers in all aspects of labor and employment law. It's germane to say she's a managing shareholder in the firm and one of the founders of the firm's Philadelphia office. Mary Tiernan, our returning champion from the EEOC, is on the set tonight. She is the outreach and education manager with the Philadelphia office. Another familiar face, Anthony Howler, returns to our program tonight. Corporate Defense Counsel with the top 100 law firm, Blank Rome. Chambers USA refers to him as a calming force in difficult circumstances, much as what happens here on the set. And Gina Passarell, another familiar face with ALM, Global Newsroom, the senior editor there, and of course, our feature reporter. And Gina, let's go ahead and start with you. I know that ALM and you have been very involved in researching and investigating and reporting on pay equity issues, especially in the legal profession. Why now? It's a good question because pay equity is not a new thing by any means. We've been talking about this for a long time, but the time felt right, particularly in the legal profession, because we started seeing a number of high dollar, high profile lawsuits by women partners against their very large law firms, alleging that their male counterparts were being paid a lot more. And we wanted to look into why this was happening now. And what we also found was States are increasingly looking at legislation in this area, trying to kind of give a little more teeth to the federal equal pay law within their states. And there's a lot of litigation going on across the country in other industries. And it's also become a really big issue for the presidential election. Part of your frustration and your colleagues' frustration is that some of the sources that you thought might be more forthcoming were not. This is true. Um, you know, we, we can't force people to, to talk about issues they don't want to, but sometimes I wish we could. Um, that there was a study that came out just last week talking about how the pay gap um, in the legal profession, male partners made 44% more than their female counterparts. And we thought that was a big enough gap to go to these large firms, much of which were included in this survey, and say, what's going on? Why, why do you think the survey is showing this? And, and what, if anything, are you doing in your firms uh, to, to make sure it's not happening at your firm? And, and frankly, most firms didn't get back to us. And many who did said, we don't talk about compensation issues. And you have to wonder if that's not perhaps part of the problem. Well, let me uh, switch to, to Mary Tiernan, because I'll go to the, the, the really the only person on this set tonight that has a what I would say more of a plaintiff's perspective, although, again, you come out of the EEOC, Mary. But it is kind of ironic that the very profession that has been tasked with safeguarding equal protection under the law has seemingly dropped the ball in its own house. Yes, and you know, just uh, a reminder, during the investigation, of course, we're neutral. It's if uh, at the end of an investigation we think that there was a violation and we can't work it out that if we go into court, then we're on the, the plaintiff side that way. But I, I think it is disappointing. I think it shows that no profession is immune to pay discrimination. I think, as Gina pointed, the lack of discussion and pay transparency is a reason the problems can persist. And I think that's one reason EEOC and OFCCP have implemented new pay reporting guidelines that are going to take effect March 2018 to try to gather that information to help us better address these pay gaps. And we hope we'll encourage employers, including law firms, to do the self-analysis and kind of audit their practices and see what they can do better before EEOC or the Department of Labor is knocking on their door. Well, we're going to drill down a little further, especially with our corporate defense counsel. But let me roll in some video here from uh, Laurel Bellows, former ABA president, and Bobby Levenberg. Here's what they said about the state numbers. of the state. Women have been graduating law school in more than a third all right, since 1974. Why in the world are women only 16% of equity partners in law firms? And while you know we're seeing more women as uh, chairs of law firms, we have some even here in Philadelphia, they still represent only 5% of the managing partners of the top 200 U.S. law firms. So, Tough again, question, especially for a female. Who is a managing shareholder? That is true. Is there some merit to what they're saying? Well, the numbers are what they are, and a smaller percentage of lawyers who are equity partners are female than if you were to compare it to, for example, the group of you know junior associates in a law firm. But I think that the reasons for that are highly complex and often very, very personal. So I'm hesitant to ascribe those numbers to discrimination, certainly. If you look even just at the, Gina made reference to the fact that a number of law firms didn't get back to her when she reached out to try to get some information. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the surveys, the number of respondents are very small. 
Um, so, you know, maybe 300 law firms or something like that were surveyed, and I think the response rate was 3%. It calls into question perhaps the legitimacy of any conclusions that might be drawn because from Because a lot survey. of those law firms do talk about compensation at the end of the year, what the, you know, what the new associates are making and that sort of thing. So yes. it, to me, it's, it sounds like if they say, well, we don't comment on matters of compensation, it sounds somewhat disingenuous. 16%, Anthony, something's wrong because we're talking about a generation after women were graduating at the same levels as, as men. If that is the number, isn't there something well, wrong on its face? Well, I... I think that there is a problem generally in this country over pay equity, no question. And this has been a year of major le legislation throughout the states, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But I think you have to be very careful looking at these kind of statistics and then extrapolating conclusions from them. So if you look nationally, forget lawyers for a minute, and I'll come back to them. At the national statistics are that women, approximately 23% of women, withdraw from the workforce entirely uh, during childbearing years uh, from about the age of you know, 32 to, to 40. And about then another 17% choose to go part-time. If you take that principle and apply it to what's happening in law firms, because of the stresses that are imposed in law firms, the way that we are measured, so hours matter, how hard you work matter, that's a very challenging profession for people who want to have some balance in their lives from people who have children, and women bear still today the greater responsibility of caring for children. And so as a result, what's happening is there are a lot of very talented women who would make partner, who would make equity partner, who would make as much as comparable men, mm -hmm. who choose for those reasons not to continue in the profession. So the statistics really I don't think tell the entire story. And I think, it's, I think it's wrong to say that there is this endemic problem. I'm not saying there isn't a problem mm -hmm. in some quarters, but I have had the, uh, I've had the privilege of sitting on two compensation mm -hmm. committees at two major law firms. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can say with certainty that, the, that not only um, is it a priority to pay women the same on the same criteria, but it's also good business these days. I think our clients are mm -hmm. expecting that we do that. Well, I think Anthony is, is totally right in talking about there, there, there might not be some large scale hidden agenda here. Maybe it's kind of, you know, a, a situation of less about intentional bias and more about that kind of, that, that bias that we don't always think about. You know, we're, we're not intentionally keeping women back, but there are aspects that go into salary. We talk about billable hours. Yes, many women may want to leave the profession to raise a family, or they may work part-time more often than men and their billable hours are lower. But what our data has found is that it all, they're also being billed out at lower rates. So you have to ask, why are women's billable rates lower than their male counterparts? Women talk a lot about you know, who's giving out the assignments and who are they being given to? Are they giving the, the good assignments? And it's not necessarily purposeful. You, you, give, uh, you give work to people who look like you. You talk to the people who you're comfortable with, who you share experiences with. And I've heard a lot in our reporting on this subject that until more women rise to the ranks of you know, law firm leader or that senior shareholder group, that that's not going to quite close the gap. And that's why some women um, have chosen to sue, because they don't want to wait for that, that shift to come naturally. We talked about earlier women choosing to go part-time. How much of it is it really a choice or lack of flexibility when they do have more of the child care responsibilities? Um, sometimes, you know, there might be a little bit more flexibility for a guy with child care responsibilities or, or other caregiver responsibilities than there might be for a woman. So to pin it all on choice of she's choosing to go part-time, it might not be, have been a full choice. It might be, well, I'm not getting the assignments or I'm getting comments from partners or from other associates. I'm going to go into uh, my own practice or I'm going to go into government or I'm going to go in-house because they feel like they don't have any other choice. See, I, I worry that that type of discussion diminishes sort of what the real issue is. Because I think that one of the problems um, when we talk like that is that we're not really looking at the root causes of why we have um, pay disparity. I mean, for instance, if you look again nationally, a lot of the statistics are very skewed because women have gone into lower paying type professions. Even though women graduate, at higher levels than men, more women get master's degree, more, more women get doctorates. But it's in 
areas like social work, for instance, or education, nursing. So where, you're saying they're just where, gravitating to those professions yes, that pay so, less? Even though they have the jobs. Done, even though they have the educational jobs. As a general jobs. proposition, that, that is what has happened. And a lot of the pay disparity that is reported in the statistics is a result of the difference in occupation of men versus women overall in the economy. I want to respond to that because it, it ties in a couple of things. One of the things that we're seeing, I think, one of the reasons that the, this issue is new again is because it's hitting professional services firms when it hadn't before, and those are typically the higher paying jobs. And they're harder cases to bring, right? What jury is going to say, oh, poor woman lawyer, you made a million instead of the two million that, that your male counterpart made. But it goes back to Chris's point about origination. The same study that found a 44% gap across all partners also found that women were definitely originating uh, less business. And so perhaps you know that is the cause for the pay gap. If you're not bringing in the business, we're not going to pay you as much. But there was one, one of the firms that did call us back said, you know, we don't put as much uh, toward origination in our firm's compensation model because we know that that partner who went out and yes, he or she got the business, she got it off of the backs of all of the rest of us who are known for our good work and who help for that. And so we're going to spread that wealth around. So there, there are different ways to kind of attack this, regardless of perhaps what the root cause is. Do we want to make ourselves a little uncomfortable, look at the issue, and decide, is this something we want to address? Because I, I've heard in general counsel, women um, in-house legal departments say, you know, it's much easier for us to address this than it is for a law firm, which is typically a little bit more bureaucratic. We can just go and make one decision to review our compensation and say there's an anomaly here, a statistical anomaly, we need to correct it. I think that's an excellent point. Why wait and just say, well, women are choosing to leave for childcare or other issues or going part-time? I think it is incumbent on law firms. What can we do to not lose the talent, like you said, if they spent money recruiting people and want the best and they've deemed you know, uh, how many women coming into the firm as some of the best out there? Why wouldn't law firms try to be proactive and keep them and maybe change some of the models or change compensation practices to be more fair and have the retention that will let more women advance to the equity partners and um, increase their compensation? Do you have the right to ask your colleagues what they are paid? And what's the best advice for women who are entering any profession, but especially the legal profession, to make sure that the playing field is even? Is litigation the answer? Back in just a minute. Why do you think that women make less money than men? I think these are very underrated because they can do more, but people expect them to do less. Allison, I feel like you're not giving this job 100%. You're right. I'm giving it about 78%. This week's American Law Journal is made possible in part by Law Catalyst, video and film production for the legal profession. Go to lawcatalyst.com. Beatty, Sloan, and DeGenova providing consumer protection in injury matters for over 30 years. Swartz Cullenton PC, a personal injury law firm that concentrates on safeguarding the wounded. Get the justice you deserve. And The Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media publication and the oldest law journal in the United States. We continue to be told we should be grateful just to have the opportunity to play professional soccer and to get paid for doing it. And in this day and age, you know, it's about equality. It's about equal rights. It's about equal pay. And we're pushing for Gender pay equity, no. equal pay for equal work, a question we've been asking. Have we been answering it? Even though JFK signed it back in 1963. Tonight, I'm discussing it with four great lawyers with me on the program tonight. Christine Grady Darowitz joins us from Littler Mendelssohn, representing corporations in labor and employment matters. Mary Tiernan is with the EEOC. She's the outreach and education manager at the Philadelphia office. Anthony Haller hails from the top 100 law firm of Blank Room. And Gina Passarella, senior editor with the ALM Global Newsroom, and of course, our feature reporter. And when you sat down, Gina, and talked with Nancy O'Mara Easold, again, we were fortunate enough to have her on the program here over 20 years ago. She said She's something which she said uh, the, uh, 20 years ago. Litigation may be the only way out of this for women. She did, and she still feels very strongly about that. I mean, she, you know, she said it's the best way, really, to kind of 
air the dirty laundry, if you will, of a firm. Like we said, there's not a lot of discussion surrounding what people make in this country, regardless of profession. And if you really want to get down to what are people making and what are the differences and what goes into that discussion, her thoughts are litigation is the way to go. She still advocates for all of the other things that society and the profession have been doing all along and, and kind of f consciously focusing on this issue, but her take is that that's going to take a lot longer and litigation is the quicker way. And in your research, Gina, how successful have women been when they've litigated, especially in the last, let's say, five years or so? You know, there have definitely been a couple of big dollar lawsuits, some class actions, um, some single plaintiff uh, resolutions, but largely these cases are, are very difficult to prove. And and there, are, we've talked to a lot of plaintiff's lawyers who said, you know, these these big dollar cases make you want to go after this, and it seems to be there would be a lot of claims, and this would be a ripe area to pursue for a plaintiff's lawyer. But it's a very difficult area uh, to to prove a case because how do you prove? I mean, if the standard is equal pay for equal work. Um, that, that's a tough, tough road to, to, to go down. And a lot of confidential settlements as well in that, in that bevy of, of, of uh, results. Mary, but the one thing about this area of law is that you don't have to prove intent. I know that Gina talked, at least referred to that before, but really it's disparate impact. It's kind of like age discrimination, right? You just basically can look at the numbers more or less and say, look, you're treating women and men unequally at the workplace. Well, yeah, under the Equal Pay Act, you're not looking at intent. If they're doing substantially equal work in terms of the skill, the effort, the responsibility, you should have the um, substantially equal pay, pay them the same. Um, so that is helpful. And it, for us, if people come and file charges with us, many times we might be able to facilitate a mediation or a resolution during our mediation process or investigation or settlements before actually making a finding of discrimination. In some cases, when we've made findings of discrimination, we've gone into court if we weren't able to resolve it um, for a variety of professions. Right. Well, I think it's true to say in this area, with a high degree of certainty, that litigation can make a difference. So mm -hmm. if we think of Lily Ledbetter, uh, she brought a case against Goodyear because mm -hmm. she thought she had been paid less than men mm -hmm. uh, as a result of some poor evaluation she had early in her 20-year career at Goodyear. The Supreme Court said, you can't bring that case because the, whatever the discrimination was that led to you earning less happened quite a long time ago. And that led to the, uh, uh, President Obama's first piece of legislation, which overturned that. And one of the pieces of evidence that came out in that case was that she only found out about the differentials because of some conversations with um, some employees much later, co-employees much later in her career, right. and she brought the lawsuit. Now, the, the result of that case is not only the change in the fact that you can now bring a case even if the discrimination happened earlier, right. but throughout the country, I mean, there's a, an executive order, 13665, for all government contractors, and then there's new legislation in th at least 13 states that says you can't prohibit employees from talking about compensation. So it has really caused much greater transparency in the national uh, discourse on these issues. I would also point out that the National Labor Relations Act has been in effect for many, many, many years. And in many situations, talking about your pay is protected concerted activity for which you cannot be fired or otherwise disciplined. So that's been around for a long time. Um, at the end of the day, is it a good thing if employees are not prohibited from speaking to each other about their pay? I think so. I think that people should have the right to talk about, within reason, what they want to talk about in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, but will it make a big difference? I don't think so. I, I think in, um, encouraging people to talk about it and not having the fear of repercussions that if they talk about it, they're going to be fired. Mm -hmm does sol help solve a lot. And you know, from EEOC's pers perspective, if somebody complains to the boss, you know, I, I think I'm being paid less because of sex or race or national origin, or gets fired after, after asking coworkers and you know, goes to the boss and, and, and had said, I think this is unfair. You know, if if um, he or she had opposed pay discrimination that way a, in a good faith manner and was fired, we would say that could be unlawful retaliation. Um, so even aside from you know Massachusetts state law, you know we have, you have some protections against retaliation under the federal law, in addition to National Labor Relations Act, like Chris mentioned. And I think the heart of it is fairness. I think that if people know the parameters, if they feel that they have an open workplace that they can raise the concerns without being punished, without getting fired, without being threatened, um, without being threatened with bad references or told their you know future employers being told, hey, she's a troublemaker, you don't want her. And we've seen some of these things in our cases. If you can have the discussion, I think, and, and if 
people can understand some of the reasoning behind pay decisions or other employment decisions, sometimes that can solve the problem. You know, I, I think a lot of the perceptions might drive people coming to our agency. The difficulty with transparency is that it has benefits, but it also creates a lot of conflict in the workplace if you think somebody else is being paid more than you. Yeah, but the and IRA it isn't necessarily good the, for morale not be or productivity. At your, but it may not be the IRA may not be directed at your coworker and now may be directed at the boss. It, which, it, it, or it may be both. Or it, it could may be, be both. both. Let's hear from Nancy O'Mara Isold and Bobby Liebenberg in their interviews yeah. with Gina Passarella. Um, trying to, to have a mentor when you join the firm, making sure that you ask for certain assignments. Um, women have to make sure that their male counterparts, their husbands, are sharing some of the, the, the care for the house and for the children. Money is where power is. And we want to make sure that there is a critical mass of women in senior leadership positions being on the really key uh, management positions like compensation, executive partnership, and how they're faring in terms of compensation. So if women are So Chris, I've got to come right to you. Here you are, female managing shareholder. I yes. would suspect a lot of women coming to the firm probably, you may be one of the first people they talk to. Um, I am one of the first people that many women talk to. I'm one of the first people that many men talk to as well. I worked through having two children who are kind of adults at this point and doing pretty well. Um, and I do give advice. I give a lot of advice. I try to help people. And the biggest piece of advice I give, and it sounds a little hackneyed, but it's really true, find a mentor. Find somebody who cares as much about your career as they care about their own. And if you're successful in doing that, that makes a huge difference for every person who comes in the law firm, male or female. So short of litigation, Gina, would you say that, what was the most important piece of advice that you heard uh, Nancy Easold suggest that, that women need to get to the highest echelons of power as quickly as possible, as elegantly as possible, I mean that in the power concept, and that they need to be involved in some of those decision-making committees that could affect their future. Exactly, and I think, I think Chris hit on a lot of those issues. They need to, you know, it is a marathon, not a sprint. I mean, they need to stick with it. They need to realize that some days are going to, and Bobby Liebenberg said this too, some days are going to be tough, some days are going to be good. Uh, but you need to do your best. I mean, I always say, you know, there's no defense against excellence. You just, you have to work your hardest, and, and that, that should and can and often does get rewarded. But there, you know, you want to make sure you're getting on the committees. You make sure you're, you're speaking up, asking for the assignments, finding that mentor. And, and Nancy, Easel herself said at the end of the day the same thing that you said, Christopher. You know, and sometimes the, the men just need to kind of help out with that home duties a little bit more. That was one of her takeaways too, and that goes back to the societal issues. This is no one entity or one organization is going to solve this this issue. And you know, we can read more about this in ALM publications, right? This is going to be really published throughout the entire footprint. Absolutely, yep. A number of articles are going to come out looking at this issue quite in depth. Fantastic. I want to thank my guest tonight, Chris Derowitz, joining us tonight from Littler, Mendelssohn, Mary Tiernan from the EEOC, Anthony Haller from Blank Rome, and our own Gina Passarella with the ALM Global Newsroom. For all of us here at ALJ, thanks for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed.